phone call. Hello, everyone. Welcome to 52 Weeks of Leadership. My name is Molly Anderson, Executive Director of the UB Center for Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness. Glad to have all of you back with us in week 34. Uh, we are thrilled to have today's speaker, Dr. Chuck Lindsay, back for part two of his presentation on data analytics. Uh, today's topic is the role of analytics in the future of work and leadership. Jim has his, or I'm sorry, Chuck has his PhD from the Kelly School of Business in Indiana University, and he's taught a variety of classes in statistics, digital marketing, website analytics, and more. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Geico, for making this program possible. Uh, without further ado, let's turn it over to Dr. Chuck Lindsay. Thanks so much, Molly, for having me. Uh, very excited to uh, give this uh, second part. Uh, uh, this this talk uh, second part uh, discussion on uh, data and analytics and especially with an emphasis on leadership and the future of, of work. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, share my slide deck with uh, uh, the folks at home or wherever you may be. Okay. There we go. So you know, at the end of the day, uh, when people think about DNA, data and analytics, so often they think about uh, number crunching and formulas and uh, uh, AI, machine learning, things of that nature. You're going to be real disappointed if you were expecting anything along those lines. Uh, because what we're going to focus on again is the role of analytics in the future of work and leadership. And this is an incredibly important issue. Why? Well, let's, uh, Molly did a good job introducing myself, so I don't, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to uh, say any more uh, on my background. Uh, why is leadership and, and the role of work, and especially, I'm going to focus mostly on leadership today. I've got a few slides at the end where I'll talk about people analytics and, and the role of uh, work, um, but, uh, or the future of work in analytics. But why, uh, why is, is the topic of leadership and analytics so important? Because uh, we, we really have a problem in the analytics space. Uh, the first wave of analytics and data scientist hires have really been underwhelming in terms of the value produced for most companies. Uh, this is from Accenture, a recent uh, report, 2019, and I have all of the sources at the end of the presentation. Um, only 32%, less than a third of companies report being able to realize tangible and measurable value from data. While 27%, only 27% said DNA projects produce insights and recommendations that are highly actionable. And I'm going to foreshadow, I'm going to just cut to the chase right now. Uh, it's really a leadership problem. But let me, let me show you one other quote from the Accenture report. Uh, a survey of 190 execs in the U.S. revealed that the biggest impediments related relate to cultural and operational challenges, a lack of trust surround, uh, surrounding the use of data, and an, and an inability to operationalize data to use it strategically. And, and no holistic enterprise strategy. Uh, you know, you th if you think about it, it mergers and acquisitions in finance, uh, the biggest reason for failure when everything looks good on paper, you know how this story is going to end, cultural issues uh, between the two organizations, different cultures, different organizational cultures, and, uh, and a problem there uh, just making it work, operationalizing what otherwise looked good on paper in terms of a merger and an acquisition. There's the same issue presents itself in the DNA area when we're talking about data and analytics. Uh, it's no different. So at the end of the day, as I foreshadowed a, a minute ago, analytics is a leadership issue. This is from uh, a, a recent uh, white paper by Gartner Research. As a matter of fact, it just came out last month, uh, July of, of 21. 
And uh, it's, it's a white paper where they talk about seven pillars related to DNA governance, data and analytics governance, best practices that firms should be employing. And I'm just going to talk about two of the seven, the two that I think uh, are, are the most important. But before we get to uh, th those two, uh, uh, two of the seven pillars, let's look at this quote uh, up at the top of the, the slide. Leaders know that without good governance, their investments in DNA will fail to meet key organizational demands, such as revenue growth, cost optimization, better customer experiences. So let's specifically look at two of the seven pillars that, that Gartner highlights. Number one, uh, and, and these actually happen to be number one and seven. Uh, just so so happens that I, when I looked at the seven pillars uh, for DNA governance that Gartner highlights, the two that I feel are most important were, were, were numbers one and seven. So governance efforts, number one, governance, governance efforts should be directly connected to business strategy and priorities. However, organizations are orient their DNA governance practices around data rather than business. Big mistake. And later on in the discussion, the talk, we're going to identify key action steps. So we want to make sure that our metrics and KPIs and all of our data and all of our analytics are directly connected and tied to and start with business strategy and priorities. And again, how do we do that? We'll talk about that. Number seven, we want to focus on collaboration rather than centralization. Big problem with the first wave of DNA and data scientist hires. A lot of that has been centralized. Let's put the data scientists together. Let's centralize the analytics process. And what uh, firms are finding is that uh, if, if you do that, go back to number one, the pillar number one, it, it really sometimes is then divorced from business strategy and, and, and business, important business outcomes. Uh, so we wanna focus on collaboration rather than centralization. DNA governance can't be seen as bureaucratic, a bureaucratic activity, rather it needs to focus on people-to-people -people interaction, storytelling, knowledge sharing, and innovation. Everyone, Gartner has another piece that just came out uh, this summer as well, uh, or actually, I guess, technically right late spring. I, I believe it came out June 16th, uh, another white paper. And uh, they talk about this notion of citizen data scientists. CDS, that it's kind of like the military, right? Whether you're an accountant in the military or IT or uh, you're, you, you, you operate a tank, first and foremost, and what when they say you're a soldier, first and foremost, you're a soldier. And whether, whether it be, uh, you know, whether you're uh, in IT or you're in accounting, uh, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, uh, we want everybody, HR, we want everybody talking about data. We want everybody talking about analytics. So, so those are the two pillars that I think are, are most important when it comes to DNA governance and best practices. So going back to pillar number one, tying all data, all analytics, all metrics, all key performance indicators, KPIs to business strategy and priorities, uh, how do we do that? How do we align metrics and strategy? Well, I think the first thing to keep in mind is the questions are always more important than the answers. Every now and then I'll get somebody that challenges me uh, on this. One of my perhaps you know, executive MBA students, I teach statistical analytics in our EMBA program. And uh, really, they, they ask, isn't, isn't the, what, if, what, if it's a, what if the answer is the wrong answer? Well, but what if the question is the wrong question? If you don't start with the right question, the answer doesn't matter. Uh, and, and so the last thing we want to do is, uh, and you see this in organizations very often, companies using data 
out of convenience. The data happens to be available, so they try to find a use for it, as opposed to starting with the question, starting with the business problem, the strategy, the goal, and then working backwards and trying to identify metrics that can help inform whether you're making you're going to you're, you're making positive progress toward that goal or not. Uh, number two, in aligning metrics and strategy, avoid status quo bias. Uh, there's a really good example here, I think, and it stems from the movie Moneyball. Uh, I'm sure that uh, a subset, uh, if not everyone out there, you're familiar with the early 2000, the, the movie that came out in the early 2000s uh, it, uh, titled Moneyball. It was, uh, I think, I want to say Brad Pitt was uh, the, the, the star of the movie. And let's face it, Hollywood doesn't make a movie about statistics unless something happened very impactful and transformational. And so what happened is uh, Billy Bean, the manager of the Oakland A's, hired Paul De Podesta kind of a, a quant person to come in and take a look at whether they were tracking the right metrics, uh, Billy being the coach of the Oakland A's. And so De Podesta came in and what they found in the early 2000s is that, you know, batting average was less predictive of offensive success. And I, this is kind of an esoteric example. If you're not a baseball fan, I apologize for the, the jargon, but batting average wasn't as predictive of offensive success and wins as something called slugging percentage and a few other metrics. Yet batting average was the metric that almost all, I'm gonna say firms, almost all teams had been using for the past 50 years. The key performance indicator uh, to measure offensive success and to hire individuals to draft players out of college in the minor leagues. And it really turned uh, baseball upside down, at least uh, the process of reviewing and recruiting and, and uh, uh, hiring players. And that's when we saw over the last, the, the, the ensuing, the, the last 15 years or so, every sports team now uh, ramp up their analytics and uh, you really can't find a sport uh, without a professional that uh, where a professional team doesn't have a cadre of analytics folks. Uh, so just because batting average, just because you've been collecting data in a certain way, or you've been tracking metrics, certain metrics, doesn't mean that you should continue to do that. Very often, if you go back and you look at everything with fresh eyes, you find out, okay, some of these metrics we're not even using. And they, they don't really tell us a lot. Why are we collecting this data? So you start with the business problem. And that takes us to the third bullet point. If you, you start with the business problem, you say, well, what are the two or three metrics that would, if I had my druthers, if I, if, if, if I were a king for a day uh, and I could have any data I wanted, uh, what are the two or three types of data or metrics that would really let me know quarter to quarter, year over year, if I had that data, whether we're going in the right direction or not? And if you can't think of, if you can't identify some external or internal uh, data uh, when you're brainstorming, put a pin in it. Better to uh, use a blank placeholder than uh, react hastily and put the wrong metric in place. You better, I say better to be in no relationship than the wrong relationship. So really we're talking about a new paradigm here. Uh, the old paradigm, and I'm sure, I don't, I bet each and every one of you in the last year, you've heard it at least five times if you've heard it once. Data-driven, data-driven this, data-driven that, data-driven decision-making. Well, there's a, a recent article that came out in the Sloan MIT Review where they really take this mindset to task and they, they tie it back to these underwhelming uh, uh, organizational outcomes that uh, 
companies, firms have experienced over the last 10 years or so in terms of employing data and analytics. Uh, much ado about nothing, really, at the end of the day. All, all these data analytics hires, uh, quite a bit of investment in the data analytics area. And then you saw at the very beginning that Accenture paper, uh, less than a third of all firms report really uh, getting value, good value out of their analytics initiatives. And so these folks at MIT, this paper that came out in the Sloan MIT review recently, they tie much of it back to putting the cart before the horse data-driven decision-making, and they argue it shouldn't be data-driven decision-making, it should be decision-driven data. So let's look at the difference. The data-driven decision-making, analytics 1.0, the last 10, 15 years, anchor on data that is available. It's convenience surveys and what data we have available. Can Hey, can we find a use for this, Tom, Jim, Mary? Would you, you don't do that with products, do you? You don't do that with product lines. You don't, you don't produce something, I mean, every now and then by accident, but typically R&D, right? You don't produce something just to produce it and say, hey, can we find a market for this? It's the other way around. Let's, is there some sort of need, some sort of want that's not being fully uh, met? And can we design a product to meet that need? or that one for a particular segment or multiple segments. And so, uh, so instead of anchoring on data that is available, we wanna anchor on a decision to be made. Uh, instead of finding a purpose for data, we wanna find data for a purpose. So we're reverse engineering it. Instead of starting from what is known, we wanna start from what is unknown. And instead of empowering data scientists, the heck with that, we wanna empower decision makers. It's just like IT. Right, IT, as it matured, became a function within a company, but we didn't really, as IT matured as a function, we didn't empower the IT folks. Uh, the IT folks really uh, were there and, and are there to empower decision makers within a firm. Uh, so, so this is the new paradigm. And I think I'm going to call this DNA, data and analytics 2.0. And I think this is what you're going to see over the next 10 or 15 years. And I think the firms that are able to move quickly uh, are really going to uh, extract quite a bit of value and they're going to be ahead of the curve and it's going to serve as a point of differentiation. And they're going to more than most firms right now quickly, they're going to be able to ramp up and start realizing more value uh, from their DNA initiatives than the average firm does right now. So uh, some action items, uh, frame, you want to frame uh, critical business problems. That's where we start again. We collect data and track metrics specific and customized to the problem at hand. And we want to scale analytics across siloed firms. That kind of goes back to that, uh, that seventh pillar from the Gartner white paper that just came out last month uh, about DNA initiatives need to be more collaborative, about citizen data scientists. We're all soldiers. We're all data science soldiers and storytelling and knowledge sharing. And so scaling that across the whole firm. And this takes leadership, right? Because it, firms very often are siloed. And so it takes leaders at the highest levels within the organization, steering committees, so forth and so on, C-suite teams to accomplish this. One. Uh, many companies, uh, one company that I'm thinking of specifically, I'm not going to mention the name, but a Norwegian company, uh, they do a lot of uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, if you take a look at the, the Gartner uh, white paper, uh, and again, I have the sources at the, the end of the, the presentation, uh, you'll see the name of the firm uh, in, in the white paper. Uh, 
one thing they did, and, and a lot of firms are doing this and experiencing quite a bit of success in, in terms of scaling and breaking down those silos, is at a certain level, the data is standardized. So everybody knows, and in the case of the Norwegian firm, each data point either had to do, was related to an individual, an object, like a product or a stock keeping unit, SKU. So an individual, an object, a location, or an event. Now, from there, let's say if it's a customer, there's going to be quite a bit of additional data collected with, let's say, a, 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 a longstanding customer or client. And so we can drill down vertically, but at a, the highest level within the firm, across all departments, we can count on the fact that all of the data in the firm either starts with an individual, it starts with an object, it starts with a, some sort of location data, or it starts with some sort of event and it drills down from there. So we wanna have some standardization uh, across the firm. Some additional action items, education, so important here. Uh, we wanna highlight the benefits of analytics and decision-driven analytics. And so a good example here uh, from the Accenture white paper, going back to that first white paper that I mentioned, uh, uh, TD Bank, they, uh, they've really ramped up their education initiative surrounding DNA. And specifically, they've targeted non-analytics executives and managers. So they have a data analy and analytics academy for the non-analytics executive. Because again, let's go back to that, go back to that seventh pillar from, from the Gartner white paper, uh, storytelling, knowledge sharing, getting everyone involved, everybody talking about data and analytics. We don't want our data scientists leading this conversation because so often I would argue in most cases, they're not the individuals uh, that uh, we can count on to identify meaningful business strategy, meaningful business issues, meaningful business goals. Uh, really, those individuals are you. And, and so uh, we need to make sure that uh, as a best practice, we're educating all of our uh, employees and managers and executives. Uh, and, and so uh, different academy days for non-analytics folks. Here's uh, uh, another something also that's very impactful, running your non-analytics employees and managers and executives through simulations. So this is a simulation that I really like. Uh, it's um, by Thomas Daver Davenport, and uh, it... Uh, it's entitled Data Analytics Simulation Strategic Decision Making. Uh, it's a very uh, inexpensive simulation that you can run certain uh, key stakeholders, decision makers in your organization uh, through. Uh, and, uh, and again, it, it really, the focus is not so much number crunching and so forth and so on, but really, DNA and how it relates to strategic decision making, because otherwise we don't care about it, do we? I know I don't care about it if it doesn't relate to strategic decision making in the firm. So uh, last slide on action items, we want to we want to walk the walk. We want to we, we want to encourage when we're in every chance we get any meeting we're in and someone states a conclusion or a viewpoint. Do you have data to support that point? You might not say it in, in exactly that way. Uh, you want to encourage others to, to do likewise. And we want to put in to place financial and non-financial support structure, uh, structures to encourage uh, folks to, uh, to lean in when it comes to data and analytics. Uh, I have a friend in, in Singapore and uh, who I did my PhD with, and he had a 
first time I'd ever heard somebody say it like this. He said, look, if you want to understand why people are behaving the way they're behaving, look at the incentive structure and structures in place in a company, a society, what have you. So financial and non-financial support structures. Uh, so that really, that's my take on where DNA is going. DNA best practice, what you're going to see become best practice in the next decade. And it's all related to leadership. Uh, last thing before I, I, I wrap up with a couple slides uh, on uh, the future of work, and specifically, I'm coming at this from an HR standpoint, people analytics standpoint. Uh, but one other, one other uh, source that I want to uh, give a shout out to, and and this is at the end of the slide deck uh, again. In in in, I have three slides uh, listing all of my sources. Florian Zettelmeyer, uh, the faculty uh, director for the program. Uh, for the analytics program at Northwestern University's Kellogg School uh, has a wonderful YouTube video out there where he really goes into great detail talking about, again, at the end of the day, data and analytics, it's a leadership issue. And if you're not getting full value from your data and your analytics initiatives, it's it, it really, in most cases, almost all cases, relates to uh, what I've just laid out. So, uh, so let's transition really quickly. Got uh, just a couple minutes left. Uh, quick, quick snapshot of the people analytics area. So, uh, two quotes to motivate the the discussion um, uh, related to analytics and the future of work. So the delivery of people, this ca just came out, a paper in 2019, the delivery of people data as success in and, in and of itself, rather than striving to answer the most pressing business questions with that data. This is Dave Zielinski taking HR professionals to task and talking about the fact that, look, HR at the end of the day is really about uh, driving the most important uh, business outcomes for the firm. I mean, talent, my goodness, doesn't get much more important than that. Uh, but so often, Zelensky makes the case that when it comes to data, uh, HR professionals are, are really uh, just looking at the delivery of data as opposed to how does it relate? How does this data that we're collecting help us answer the most pressing business questions? And then the second bullet point, second quote uh, from a 2017 paper, less than a third of these companies have HR analytics that measures to the point of the first bullet, uh, the first quote, have uh, HR analytics that measures the relationship between HRM processes and people and business impact. So I think over the next 10 years, what you're going to see is you're going to see HR uh, departments and uh the people analytics area, you're really going to see a transformation there, where it's it, it's it's really uh, a, it, 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 it's really not just about collecting data anymore and and uh, reporting basic descriptive descriptive uh, 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 data summaries. You know how many people were hired. Uh, what the what the retention rate is, how many applications, things of that nature. You're going to see HR and people analytics transform from that, what I would call version 1.0, using data to version 2.0, which is, okay, uh, less about data summaries and descriptive reports and more related to how can we utilize data at, within the HR function and the people analytics area to actually uh, drive important business outcomes for the firm. And two, and I've got just, uh, what, two minutes left, uh, two metrics that I want to bring your attention to, uh, e-net promoter scoring and employee lifetime value. You're going to see both of these a lot over the next 10 years in HR and people analytics. And a great book I want to, that I, I'd like to uh, refer uh, you to is, is entitled CMO of the People by David Krillman and Peter Navin. And uh, this is a quote by David Ulrich um, at the University of Michigan about the book. This work reinforces that HR 
as I said on uh, uh, when I was discussing the previous slide, HR is not about HR, but it's really about delivering business impact. And in that book, he talks about a number of different metrics across different HR areas and sub areas. But the two that I want to bring your attention to, if you're not already familiar with them, eNet Promoter Scoring and Employee Lifetime Value. I've got uh, about a minute left, so I'll be quick. ENPS has net promoter scoring has been used by uh, the operations function and the marketing function for years in firms, where we look at uh, we have a scale of zero to 10, and we ask consumers after they've had an experience with us, we ask them, would you, how likely are you to recommend this uh, product or our firm to someone else? There are different versions of the question. And uh, zero to six, we add up the percentage that gave the gave us a zero to six. We add up the percentage that gave us a seven and an eight. And we add up the percentage that gave us a nine and a 10. And we subtract the percentage that gave a nine and we from if we we subtract the percentage that gave a zero to six from the percentage that gave a nine or a 10. That's why it's called net promoter score. And we look at we look at as net promoters, as we embark on different customer service initiatives, what happens to net promoter score? Some help, some. Some perhaps helped and our net promoter score increased. Some didn't help. We thought that this particular initiative or that initiative would actually increase satisfaction. And we thought net promoter scoring would go up and it didn't go up. So we kind of monitor net promoter scoring quarter over quarter, year over year uh, to look at what is really moving satisfaction. Well, now firms are starting to employ that in the HR space uh, with talent and employees and managers. So what really bumps, would you, recommend, would you recommend this firm as a place to work? What really moves the needle when it comes to e-net promoter scoring and what doesn't? And how does that affect retention in different departments across the firm? And so you're gonna see a lot more of that and then employee lifetime value. Uh, and I'm a minute or two over, employee lifetime value, basically finance firms and finance departments and marketing departments within firms have used this for a while now to, we, to value different segments. How long does a customer stay with the firm? And obviously that has implications then for how financially valuable a customer is to a firm. And what you're starting to see is HR departments and folks in the people analytics space use employee lifetime value uh, or use lifetime value to value employees. Do certain types of hires, certain types of job functions, do those people stay longer with the firm than other hires and other job functions and other areas? And what are the implications then if, if you have greater retention, uh, presumably, they're generating greater employee lifetime value for the firm, and so you might you, you might uh, be willing to train those and spend a little bit more on training, so forth and so on. So I think you're going to see both ENPS and employee lifetime value. You're going to see much more of those two metrics, um, and that really has to do with analytics and the future of work. But that's a I would encourage everyone to take a look at. Uh, the, the book, The CMO of People by Krillman and Peter Navin, uh, a lot of important metrics in there. And I think uh, many of those metrics you're going to see over the next 10 years, version 2.0, data and analytics and the future of work. So sorry, I, I went over by uh, about three minutes. I apologize. No uh, that's, problem, Dr. That's Lindsay. all I have for today. Um, I, I'd be happy to take any questions if, if you have time. Well, thank you so much for this high energy presentation on data analytics uh, and encouraging and motivating us all to be soldiers, especially those leaders who would consider themselves non-analytic. Uh, we do have a question from Rick Steinberg, our school management executive in residence. He asked, based on your experience, what are some of the often used business metrics that may not be the right ones? Oh, goodness, so many. <laughs> Uh, so in the digital space, uh, great question, Rick, in the digital space, 
we very often see firms, and I'm just going to use some marketing uh, acronyms here and, and some marketing jargon. We very often see firms focus on things that I'll, metrics that I will refer to as vanity metrics. Anybody familiar with vanity metrics? So website visits. Well, who cares about website visits if no one's buying? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there's a famous uh, Harvard Business School case based on an actual situation where a company ran some promotions, website visits increased, uh, purchase conversions, actual purchases, you know how this story is going to end, decreased. Website visits increased, conversions decreased. And the average order value per conversion, how much the on average what someone spent when they did convert stayed the same. So the firm was actually taking in less money, uh, but yet spending more money because they were running some sort of a promotion. And so uh, I would say very often you, you need to look at your vanity metrics within a firm. Uh, what looks good cosmetically and maybe intuitively you would think, oh, that's a great metric to track, but it really doesn't mean a lot. So website visits, uh, click-through rates, uh, Again, click through can be important as long as it's positively correlated with an increase. If you increase, if you bump up your click through rate by 10%, that increases your conversions by 10%, great. But very often you don't see a correlation uh, between click through and conversions. And, and so that, that becomes problematic then if you're tracking click through uh, because it's not leading to an additional bump in conversions. So uh, I'll refer you and long-winded answer, I'll refer you to Avinash Kaushik. He has a website called Occam's Razor. It's uh, one of the most widely uh, read uh, blogs, if you will, on analytics in the world. It's called Occam's Razor, and he has a list of vanity metrics. So if you go to his website and you use the internal search bar or field and you put in vanity metrics, you're going to get a, a, an entire blog piece, a post on vanity metrics and, uh, and, and, and Avinash really taking to task uh, managers and encouraging them to really think deeply about their metrics and, uh, and weed the garden, as he says, weed the garden, get rid of the metrics, the data you're collecting that really you're not using or it's not really uh, leading to business impact. Longest answer ever, sorry. Well, thanks for the bonus material, Chuck. That's all the questions we have for today. Thanks everyone for joining us. And next week, Dr. Dorothy Shaw Samoa is gonna be joining us on the topic of leading with an intercultural mindset. So we hope you all be back with us next week. And another shout out to our sponsor, Geico Careers. Thanks everyone. Thanks again, Chuck. My pleasure.